Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all so much for participating today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review. The first thing that today's webinar is, of course, being recorded and will be posted within three to five business days on our website at www.greatplainsquin.org. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation today. Uh, that's, uh, we hope so. Um, we're without our communications person today, so this is all on me, and we'll see how I can get through this next hour on my own without that support. Uh, the chat box is located on the bottom right side of the screen. Please feel free to post questions, and we will address those at the end of the presentation today. Welcome to the Targeted Assessment for Prevention, also known as TAP Strategy, to drive healthcare-associated infections quality improvement. This webinar is pre being presented by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization for Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Our mission is to achieve the aims of better health care, improved health, safer care, and lower health care costs. My name is Nancy McDonald, and I'm a program manager for the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, working with the quality reporting and payment programs. The TAP strategy is a framework for quality improvement developed by the CDC to use data for action, healthcare associated infections. The Health Services Advisory Group, Christine Martini Bailey, on BSN certified Six Sigma Green Belt, I believe that's what the SCC at TB stands for, will be reviewing how to run and interpret these reports to improve healthcare associated infection measures and impact value based reimbursement. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend and speaker today, Christine Martini Bailey. Christine combines her clinical knowledge and bedside experience as a critical care registered nurse with 16 years of quality improvement experience in settings across the continuum of healthcare to bring a patient-centered focus to her work. Her passion and high energy has allowed Ms. Bailey to successfully partner with healthcare providers to improve and sustain changes in the delivery and outcomes of patient care. Ms. Bailey serves as the Director of Quality Improvement and Patient Safety for the Health Services Advisory Group, as well as a premier HIN partner for the new Hospital Improvement Innovation Network. Ms. Bailey is also certified in the Lean Six Sigma, which enhances her process-driven approach to quality improvement. Her motto has always been, people do not fail, processes fail. I've heard her say that several times. So thank you, Christine, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today, and I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you for inviting me to present um, to all the participants on the line. Um, this is definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, my own father passed away from a central line infection where he got MRSA uh, sepsis from a, a bloodstream infection. So, um, you know, I, I've been working on HAI uh, more years than, than uh, we've gone to admit, and um, I, I had the honor to work very closely with the CDC and even present with them a few times on this strategy. Um, honestly, this, the TAP strategy and the TAP reports are probably the best thing to come out of NHSN. Um, as far as helping us target our, our quality improvement efforts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go right into the meat of things. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, mention some important reminders, and the first of which is about mapping. Um, nothing in NHSN will be accurate if your units are not mapped correctly. It has a very strong impact on the predictive models, um, so it will it will impact your SIRs um, because you won't get the correct risk adjustment. A good example of that is um, a, a unit with above eighty percent of oncology patients. It's not wrong to map it as a medical ward, but your it's not going to be as accurate 
where a surgery unit that takes greater than 80% of, um, of you know, uh, orthopedic patients. So you're not going to get the right predicted number of infections if you don't map it correctly. And it's all about you can call the unit whatever you like. Um, call it Joe or Bob if you want to. Um, but it's the CDC location code that really drives um, those predictive models. So it's important to refer back to that manual um, that the CDC has out there. I have a link at the bottom of my slide. And, and really reevaluate. And I would reevaluate at least annually. Um, and, and keep touch when you know your hospital is moving and shifting units or patients. Um, and keep in touch with those unit managers to make sure um, the, the level of acuity as well as uh, the type of patient they're caring for has not changed. So this is a great example. Um, and, and this is a, a, a big institution, of course, because they have a critical care oncology unit. Um, and it had been matched as critical care medical. Um, so when we look for CLADSI, the predicted model, um, the predictive model predicted one case. And they actually had three CLADSIs in that year. So when you look at the SIR, um, they had an SIR of three, which was huge. Um, we don't see that too much these days. But once we match it correctly, it was 0 0.75. So they still have some opportunities for improvement, but it definitely, um, you know, makes a big difference uh, of how that unit is mapped. Um, here's another example of um, a unit that was mapped as a critical care med search ward, and it was actually a critical care neuro. And this isn't as drastic of a difference, but it still it still can make a difference in your SIRs. And as we know, when we're trying to hit those value-based purchasing targets, um, every number of counts um, with this. So again, we evaluate annually the location, the case mix, and the acuity. Um, any changes in the location, if, if the unit just moves and it's going from two north to two west, um, you can just rename it, um, but if the mix or the acuity changes, you need to map a new unit, and please don't ever delete a unit. You just inactivate it, and, you know, um, your HINs and your QIOs are, and the CDC is always there to help you, um, and don't forget about that 80-20 rule. Um, I will tell you there's an option. I've had some units that are, you know, 75% oncology or 75% renal, and you can um, do a virtual ward. I will tell you it is very challenging because you've got to be able to tease out um, those line days um, and, and your patient days, um, and it's, it can be very difficult, but it, it can be done. Um, and again, I would I strongly encourage you to reach out to um, NHSN or your QIO or HIN for assistance with that. So let's talk about the TAP strategy. It is developed by the CDC, and it is a data-driven approach that allows us to target our quality improvement efforts to units with a disproportionate burden of ATI. So it allows us to drill down to the unit or units that have the most excess um, infection. So there are three parts to the TAP strategy. The first part is the TAP report, and they're in NHSN, and um, I know I said this earlier, but I think um, you guys are still hearing the, the music in the background, but I truly feel these TAP reports are the best thing that has ever been produced by NHSN when it comes to tools for quality improvement. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, it allows us to identify facilities or units with the biggest opportunity for improvement. The next part of the TAP strategy is to assess. And um, the assess are, it's, they call it an assessment, but I really look at it more as a survey. And you, um, we're going to get a little deeper into it, but you provide it to your staff and your frontline staff managers. Um, we want a multidisciplinary group, and it really allows us to identify gaps 
in their knowledge. And, um, you know, we can have the best policies, processes, and procedures, but if the staff doesn't know about them, it, it, you know, it's useless. So this really allows us um, to measure those gaps in knowledge. And then the TAP tools um, at their website. There are many, many tools, resources, implementation guides. So um, all three of those areas work together, target, assess, and prevent for success. So what's so great about um, the TAP report? So if I am doing quality improvement work, if I am an infection preventionist, and I walk up to a staff member on a critical care medical ward or unit, and I say, you know, for a unit this size and this type, um, you have had four more patties than you should have. That is very, very different and it's a very different reaction than if I had that conversation and said, this unit has an SIR of 1.2 and we really should be 0.88. What does that mean? Um, so this gives us, the tax report gives us a tangible number uh, a definite number and not ambiguous and harder to understand like the SIR. So um, it uses a metric called a cumulative attributable difference or what we refer to as a CAD. And it's the number of excess infections or the number of infections that you need or you should have prevented to reach a goal. And we're going to take a look at that. So um, for the number of people out there, um, this is the calculation that is used for the CAD. And typically, the, the CAN CAD reports for CLAP, C, CAUTI, and C, DIF. However, any any um, measures like your uh, surgical site infections or your MRSAs, anywhere you, you have an observed number of infections, expect it, and an SIR threshold, you can produce a CAD. So we produce these for all of the different ATIs in NHSN. Um, just remember when you're doing the calculations, remember your order of operations uh, back in, in middle school math, but uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the parentheses, um, ex, uh, exponents. I don't even remember the whole the whole um, gist of it, but just make sure you, you follow the order of operations. So, um, Here's again a little comparison for your SIR and your CAD. So for your SIR, um, it, it's used for CMS reporting. That's kind of the gold standard because it is it is risk adjusted, um, but it is very sensitive to denominator data. So um, the smaller hospitals can attest to this. Um, you know, if, if you have a small number of line days, um, one infection can drive your SIR way up. Um, and, and they can be, SIRs can be more complex to understand. So the CAD is a real number, and it, and it is um, removes some of that variability for the smaller hospitals. So if you look at the examples I have below, Hospital A has a class C SIR of 0.9, but their CAD, or cumulative attributable difference, is 1. So they've had one excess of infection. If you look at um, hospital B, their SIR is 0.4, which is lower, but they've had five excess infections. So it, it does kind of put that in, into perspective. Now, absolutely, when you're looking at um, CMS value-based purchasing, you know, hospital B definitely meets the mark um, uh, in the threshold. But it also, as I said, puts in perspective that hospital B has had five excess infections versus hospital A, where the SIR is 0 0.9, but they've just had one excess infection. So we know that's a smaller hospital. So let's take a look into a uh, TAP report. Um, first of all, it will rank your units in order to based on the CAD, highest CAD to the lowest. And it, it will provide your unit name. And then, again, that CDC location type, so what you have it mapped to, um, because that's what's, again, going to drive your predictive model. It will show you your expected and observed number of infections. We're actually calling it the CDC, is calling it predicted now instead of expected. 
expected infection. So it will allow you to look at that. Um, this is the part that, that our IT really, really like is um, it has a pathogen breakdown. And when you run the reports at the bottom, there actually is a, a team to tell you, you know, EC is E. coli. Um, chaos is Klebsiella. So, so you can look at the breakdown and, and notice at the glance maybe some trends. And depending on the pathogen, you know, some are more related to in, in maintenance and, um, and others. So for Cladi, you know, do you need to include your carry care? The um, other two columns I'm highlighting now is the SIR. So it gives you a unit level SIR. And all the way at the bottom of the report in the gray bar, you can see there's a, a hospital total. So um, it allows you to look at the unit as well as um, the hospital. And then the CAD tells us our, the real story. It, it allows us to look at the number of excess infections. So if I want, if I'm looking to do work and um, roll out uh, a quality reduction program, I'm really going to focus on these two units um, in the first two lines because they have the most excess infections. Oh, let me mention one other thing. Um, not only is this, um, you know, a, a way to identify low performers, it also will help you identify high performers. So um, the, the dialogue box is kind of over it right now, but both of these units are critical care trauma units. And, you know, that, that would make me look at this and say, you know, why does that first unit, unit B, um, have so many infections compared to um, unit N. So they're actually in the negative for the CAD. You can see that's highlighted, um, negative 1.08. So it also will allow you to look and say, okay, these are my hyperfocal units. What are they doing differently? And help you identify your best practices. The other thing, and again, this has to do with the variability of of your um, expected or predicted um, number of infections and, and your unit um, catheter days or line days. So here's an example. Um, we can see um, that our facility has three excess infections um, to reach the value base purchasing threshold. So we're going to look at where, where we want to focus our efforts. And Truthfully, the first two units are critical care nurses and acute step down units. They are, um, they both have opportunities for improvement. But if we base it just on the SIR, the acute step unit has an SIR of 2.6. Um, and instinctively, we would want to go there to reduce, um, uh, you know, their number of infections. But when you really look at it, the critical care med search unit has an SIR of 1.66, which is lower, but they have a total of 5.48 excess infections, where the step-down unit has 2.14. So we want to start targeting our, um, our infection our reduction program in the critical care med search unit. Um, we're looking at the, at the hospital reduced by three, and it's a lot harder to reduce when you've had five or six excess infections than one or two. So um, this can be very, very useful. And again, don't forget to look at your, for your best practices. So then the bigger question is, so how do we run these great reports? Um, so I have some screenshots, um, and all, as always, always start with a new data set. If you don't generate a new data set, um, you're, you're not going to capture your most recent data. Um, you're going to go to Analysis and Reports. And then there are subfolders, and there's one called Tap Reports. And in that, there are actually Tap Reports for acute care hospitals, um, LTACs, and earth, so inpatient rehab facilities. So you can really run these CAP reports um, for multiple different um, types of facilities. And again, what's available in the CANS reports is the CLAB, C, CAUTI, and CGES. So you're going to um, click on that report that you want and click Modify Reports. 
it's going to bring um, this dialog box up. And there's multiple tabs. So um, you can put this in, in an Excel, uh, PDF, or HTML um, version. But you're going to click on the time period. And it, this is a very important notation I have on the bottom. You can run Classy and Cloudy Monthly just like, you know, you see on FIPCS reports or any of your FIR reports. See this uh, for your tab reports can only be calculated quarterly. Um, and as you know, it's the same with any of your FIR reports. Um, it, it, it can only calculate quarterly because you have to put in the um, uh, type of test that you're you're running for CDEP. So once you put your date parameter in, you're going to go to the last tab, uh, tab that's display options, and this is where um, we can put in our tab multiplier. It's called, and there are some um, you know uh, canned um, multipliers in here: your Health and Human Services goal or your National SIRs. Um, again, I like to use the value-based purchasing thresholds because, um, you know, it's such a financial driver right now, um, and, and that's our goal. Our goal is always zero, but we do want to reach those thresholds at minimum. So you're going to select custom value, and then um, you can type in pre-type the value. So, um, you know, right now we just had our... our uh, value-based purchasing for fiscal year 2018 released. But um, for those of you who may not be familiar, CMS lives in three years. So um, let's take, for example, calendar year 2017 data. Um, they will make the payment determination in 2018, but the payment itself doesn't hit until fiscal year 2019. So... Um, it, you know, that's why a lot of times you'll have people from finance, CFOs coming and saying, oh, my gosh, we've just got this penalty. And when you actually look at it, it's something that happened three years ago. So it's really important to stay on top of what's coming. A measure has to be out for two years before it can become part of value-based purchasing. So, um, you know, when we started transitioning to report med surge boards on top of critical care boards, uh, for CMS, uh, you know, it was a good indication, and that was in 2015, and lo and behold, here we are for calendar year 2017 data, and it is part of value-based purchasing. Um, something I do like to point out here, um, our Claudie did go down. We've done a, a really good job reducing Claudie, but look at the huge increase for the value-based purchasing threshold for CLABSI. This isn't all because of, of the increase in CLABSI. Um, it is, if you look at, I have the asterisk here, this is inclusive of med surge swords. So what that tells me is we, we did a really good job in the critical care areas getting clavity down, but I'm really seeing a lot of central line infections in our med surge ward, wards. Typically when we do deep dives, it, it, it ends up going back to oncology patients. Uh, not all, but a, but a significant portion. So we really have to take a, a, a good look at um, those med surge wards and really start um, doing the same things we did for the critical care units as, you know, to reduce class fee. So we're going to look at group task reports. So um, this is what we use at the QIO level. Um, some of the hens are using um, group task reports. Um, and if you are from the system, you can set up a group with all of your system hospitals in it, and you can run a TAP report. And the great thing about this is it, it will allow you um, to focus on a specific facility that has a greater number of, uh, or greater burden of infection. So in this example, um, Hospital D and Hospital C um, you know, they they have a lot of burden of infections. Our um, CAD is 34.6 in Hospital D, 18.1 in Hospital C. I would actually include Hospital F, too, at 14.6. So, you know, and you look, so there's your SIRs. Um, and, again, so what's Hospital E doing? 
that their SIR is is so low and their CAT is so low. So um, it really will allow you to look and drill down to the actual facilities that need the most help. So once you define the facility, so we'll look at Hospital A and we'll look at, at their CAT report. And again, you can see um, when we drill down, there's just a couple units that's really driving um, our, our SIR for, for the hospital. Um, and, and the first unit is surgery critical care. They have had an excess of almost 11 infections. So while, you know, I definitely would want to work with all the units with a, a positive CAD greater than one, um, I definitely would want to, to begin with the critical care surgery and the critical care trauma unit. So then the assessment piece. There are um, CDC CAP assessments or surveys uh, for CAUTI, CDI, and CLAPSI. And, um, you know, several of us QIOs, um, I, I know Nancy was very involved, too, with a lot of the, the CAP assessments um, and piloting them. So um, the CAUTI and the CLAPSI, they can be very unit specific. So if we have those disproportionate units with higher burden of HAI, um, and, and we've identified them from our CAP reports, then we can administer um, the CAUTI and CLAB CAP assessments to, to specific units. Um, just based on, you know, statistical um, knowledge, we want at least 30 to make sure that we have a statistically significant um, result. It's really important for any of these CAP assessments that you get a broad array of, of um, different providers. So we want to include physicians, hospitals, nurses, nursing assistants, and you, you want management, leadership, as well as your frontline staff. Um, a lot of times what we find is, you know, management will say, you know, no, we never, never test one soul because, you know, that's what our policy says. And then you actually talk to, you know, the folks running the test or sometimes nursing staff and you ask them and they say, yes, yeah, I tested, you know, sent one school to be tested. So there, there can be a divide. So it's really good that we get um, a good diverse population. For the CDI um, CAP assessment, we like to have at least 100. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but you would be surprised. Um, um, Nancy's team has been very successful using a survey monkey um, to, to electronically collect these surveys. Um, I, I had a facility that's going to try to do it this way, and um, during their infection prevention week, we're going to have a bunch of laptops um, with the survey monkey tool up and give everybody a, a bag of popcorn if they fill out the survey or with Halloween coming, you know, one of the little bite-sized candy bars. Um, uh, we've had a lot of people opt to do paper um, just because paper tends to be easily accessible by some of our nursing assistants and environmental services transport who may not have um, access or the time to get to a computer. And and we've had folks, um, you know, do competitions, whatever department or unit that the most um, surveys turned in gets a piece of party. So people have gotten really creative um, with these. Um, so there is a general survey or assessment for the CDF, but there's two additional assessments. Those only have to be filled out once. One is for the lab, and one is for antibiotic stewardship that should be filled out by the pharmacy. I do encourage you for the lab, though, to talk to frontline staff, because as I said, we find a lot of gaps of what the policy says about repeating tools, test to cure, all of that, versus what's actually happening. So um, this is an example, uh, if you use the paper tool, of, of what the survey looks like. and um, it's, it's going to help us really have focus on educational outreach that we need to do um, because it, it's going to link how your staff answers questions from never, rarely, sometimes, often, or, you know, unknown. Some of those unknowns really 
um, are eye-opening when, when staff does not even know that a policy or, you know, I, I just saw one that like 70% of the staff did not know um, when to take a CDF patient out of isolation. So it can be very telling. Um, I do encourage if they are taking um, the paper tools to please make sure they use the um, put in what their job description is and also the years that they've been at a facility. Sometimes we find that just based on a unit having a large number of new grads or new employees. So this is an example of what the TAP feedback report looks like. So if you do a paper tool, you can um, package them up, and, and Nancy knows how to get a hold of the CDC, or she can get in touch with me, and um, we can send them to the CDC. Now, they don't keep this information, but they will enter it into um, an Excel tool that they'll send back to you with a report that looks like this. Um, Nancy can advise you um, of the survey monkey. They can do a lot of this electronically in the background. And um, this report will give you beating and lagging measures. So what are we doing really well on? And then what are some of the measures that we really need to focus that had the, the, the highest number of never, rarely, or unknown? And then it breaks it down by drivers. So what is your general infrastructure? This is one for CDI, so antibiotic stewardship. Early detection, contact precautions, and environmental cleaning. And this will tell you which questions uh, popped out the most um, for opportunity for improvement. And this is a great, I, I, I just spoke to um, a nurse educator who got really, really excited about this um, because this is going to help her really focus on what kind of education she needs. So, targeting the TAP. Um, it's very powerful. I, I met with a system um, just last month, and they were so overwhelmed. We have so much to do, and, you know, we only have so many resources, and where do I focus? And, and I said, do you have time to work on Patty in one hospital in one unit? Sure, we could do that. And I showed her by looking open her TAP report, it was one unit that was driving, they actually had 19 excess body with them, not seen that for a very long time, and it was all on one unit. So we've, we've got uh, so much power to really be able to drill down to the unit and the facility with, with um, the most excess infections. So um, it, it will allow you to generate custom reports for prioritization, um, it can be very, very powerful to say, you know, of all of our critical care units, of all of our units in the hospital, we have the most excess body. So um, it, it can be very powerful in tying it to the value-based purchasing. 25% um, of value-based purchasing comes from the patient safety domain, and that is your API measures from NHSN. So um, you, you want to build a business case quality, you can definitely show your your uh, safety how, how much work you have to do to reduce to the value-based purchasing process. So um, that is actually the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. I have my contact information here, um, or you can go through me and see, but I'm always happy um, to help anyone that is struggling with reducing its infections and, uh, you know, we really work hard and we've done a great job over the years, um, but we still have opportunities to reduce harm. So, Nancy, I'll turn it back to you for any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everyone, for your patience with regards to the um, being able to listen to the presentation, I apologize for that. Um, so I'm not sure how our question and answer are going to work with um, access to, not having access to our communications person's account, but we're going to try this. So if you want to unmute yourself for a question, I believe you can touch star six, and that should unmute your line. 
or you could please submit your question um, in the chat box. And so to start, I see we have a chat uh, question here from Larry, and he asked, how do we access the, the tax survey forms? And Larry, I guess I would ask, um, where are you from? In the Great Plains plan, you would contact your quality improvement um, advisor, your quality improvement contact for your plan. Your plan. Um, they are also available on the CDC website, um, and I can provide that website to Nancy, um, and she can share it, Larry. Um, but the whole tax strategy is laid out, and all of the forms are available at the bottom of the page. Okay. I guess I was thinking um, if you wanted the electronic version, but yes, you are right. Oh. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. electronic version, yeah, for the survey monkey, yeah, that would publish be Nancy. Um and the next question we have is from Leticia and yes, Leticia, you would be working with me since you're in our state and uh, implementing the, the tap assessment. Okay, then there's a question here from Tani. Are you going to put up location of site you showed us at the beginning of the WebEx? I'm not clear. Location of site. Do you mean where the um, where the slide will be posted, Tani? It was at the bottom of the page, she says. Um, I did post this link, okay. and that's the location description. Um, again, that can all be accessed if you go to your CDC um, uh, site, and you can you can focus that, or you know, type it in a search, and it'll focus you and, and back to that resource. Okay, and she responded that is that that is what she was referring to. Uh, okay. Now I don't have really great internet access here, but you can you can do a Google search and um, it'll bring up that this location um, manual for you. Um, there's a question here about will um, you be emailing the PowerPoint presentation as well? Uh, that will be out on the Great Plains Twin website. Um, but if you if you happen to know your quality improvement organization advisors email, you can certainly email them. They should be able to get access for you for it or to it as for you as well. If there are any other questions, I don't. Um, I'm not hearing anyone on the line. I'm assuming it's because. Um, the access code was for the person that's out on a family emergency, and so everybody is on mute, but it seems like we have um, good response in the chat box, and I appreciate that. But, um, there's a response here from Connie. It says, this has been very helpful. Thank you, Christine. Oh, anytime. I'm so glad. I hope everybody goes out and and plays with these and runs um, their top of course. I, and I also would like to um, also remind everybody, you know, kind of the device utilization um, is, is gone on the wayside because we're not going to have cool means anymore. Um, but I still encourage you when you go up to your device report um, so, and then you look at Slab and Cotty, there is a new measure called the SUR. It's just like our SIR, Standardized Infection Ratio. It's Standardized Utilization Ratio, and it is very unit-specific. So um, I, I really like it because it, it, it uses a predicted um, versus just a good mean. So you can really look at um, where your standardized utilization ratio is, again, um, if, if that's any ODE ratio, if it's 
um, greater than one, you have opportunity to reduce. If it's less than one, then you know your utilization is below what they predicted in that type of unit. Um, it also takes into consideration rural, urban, teaching, non-teaching, sizes, hospitals. So as we know with the vice utilization, it really doesn't give us much leeway um, you know, for higher acuity patients. So this is this is a little more sensitive and accurate. So I do encourage you to look at those SUR reports. Great, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. I always, when I sit in and listen to presentations, I always say to myself, if I can take away just one thing, then it was worth my time to sit in on it. And so I wrote down a couple of things during your presentation that I'd like to just say were my key takeaways is when you get into NHSM, number one, always generate your new data sets. Always generate your new data sets, especially if it's been a while since you've been in there. <clears throat> number two was to kind of have a mapping party. <clears throat> you said that mapping is extremely important, and so I guess I would encourage all of you that are listening that if, if it's been a long time before you've taken a look at how you map um, when you set up NHSN, your facility in NHSN, I would take a look at that, especially if you're um, a larger hospital and you're changing a lot of your units and your um, type of patients that you're seeing. And then you mentioned don't ever delete a unit, only and activate them when you're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah. run those run those tap reports and focus on those units that have those CADs that are indicating which units are driving um, your higher numbers. So those were my key takeaways. And I'm going to steal your idea of the mapping party. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Invite yeah, your unit good. managers and yeah, absolutely. And, and have a conversation with your leadership as well. You know, they, they don't remember the IP when they're moving units around and, you know, in the middle of a month, in the middle of a quarter, and, and they're changing and flipping acuity and patient type and how much that really can impact their value-based purchasing. So um, we don't always think of that. Um, but that's great. Invite your CNO to your mapping party. Right. And it, it's not something that's probably going to take a lot of time um, just to open up your NHS and take a look at what you've got currently mapped and see if those are um, what you do need to continue going forward with. So are there any more questions? There's no more questions in the chat. Christine, do you have any last, last minute? Yeah, the last. The last thing, I, I feel like I'm remiss if I don't mention this. Always, always, always run your CMS ICPS reports, and I'll, I'll actually go to the slide um, from Nancy and I who, who work on the QIO's guide and support folks um, who are, you know, reporting this data. There is a folder CMS report. Um, please run those and validate your data. When, when the vicar or those of the folks that call you and say, oh, you have missing data, or well, you don't have data entered, that's, the only alerts that CMS gets from NHSN is if there's no data at all. So if you've only entered, you know, one month of data or um, missed a month or two of data for one or two units, um, and those denominators can be so critical, um, you're not going to know that unless you run those CMS IPPS reports. Those are the only validation that you have that all your data was in. They're date and time stamps, so they're in before the deadline. So you can prove that and hang on to them because um, appeals and rec um, reconsiderations are getting tougher and tougher. So please run those reports and validate your data. And that's my last parting thought. <laughs> Well, thank you, Christine. Um, I I know I consider you to be one of our NHSN experts, so I uh, lean heavily on you. That's why we're having you talk today. And for everybody else on the line, again, thank you for your patience in the in the audio. I uh, appreciate uh, you bearing with us today in, a, in the wake of a family emergency for our communications manager. Uh, we appreciate and value everyone's time and your participation. So when you're done, uh, could you please take a 
few moments to complete the webinar evaluation upon exiting the system. That's all I have. Thank you, and enjoy your day. Bye.